It was being managed by a Type 2 fire use management team. Starting on about the 15th of July, the activity really started to increase with the fire. Fire behavior really picked up and they were getting some significant gains in acreage. They decided to swap out the Black Hills fire use module with the Uniweep fire use module, which was going to be eight people. And uh, myself and another local guy from the Shoshone were going to come in with them to uh, help kind of be local knowledge, uh, show where the, the fire had been, where it had been growing to, what had been going on with it, and kind of where some of the historic structures are around, around the area that, that would be threatened. Our assignment was to meet at Jack Creek Trailhead. We were going to hike in eight miles to the Venus cabin where Black Hills fire use module was been working and we were going to get a briefing from them that afternoon and the next day they were going to be hiking out. Initially that morning started off it was just going to be a hike into the wilderness. It was going to be eight miles in with a mule train. It wasn't supposed to be engaging in any fire activity. It was almost a relaxed, relaxed mindset knowing hey I got eight miles of trail to hike along the river. It's going to be a beautiful day. Go meet in with a module and the next day is going to be work. The mules took off from the trailhead around 1400 and we took off about 20 minutes after the mules. The packers were local from the area. One was a middle-aged gentleman that's been contracting with that district for quite a while and he had a helper who was a younger boy about 14 years old that was from that area also. About halfway up the trail, a little over halfway, we were about an hour a little over an hour into the hike, uh, we received a broken message that we were, uh, uh, Black Hills was advising that we find a spot downriver from the fire to stage because they didn't think we'd be able to make it through the fire to the Venus Creek cabin where we were going to meet them to do a, do a transition out with them. Um, so myself and uh, Lathan, the Unweight module leader, kind of discussed some options that we had. Uh, we were also advised that we need to try and get a hold of the packer. Uh, the packer had a radio but it was turned off and so he was going to be dropping some rolls of shelter wrap to wrap a structure with um, at the junction of the low water trail and the high water trail which comes together at Anderson Creek and so discussed with Lathan that maybe we could catch him catch the packer there to try and get a hold of him and then also when we got there there is a distinct bend in the river with a little ridge that we could get on and we would have a good view of what's actually going on and that would determine whether we need to turn around and go back to the trailhead or whether we could keep going on up to the up towards the fire or if we just need to stage and wait till it cooled down. Um, the other option was we could go up Anderson Creek to a historic structure uh, and maybe start doing prep work on that instead of just holding off. And so we uh, we proceeded up the trail. We got to uh, the junction where the packer had left the, the shelter wrap and when we got there he wasn't there so we continued up to what's uh, referred to as the turnaround point to see what the fire was doing and, and at the whole time on the hike in we couldn't really see the smoke or anything tight canyon smoke was headed off behind the ridge from us uh, but as soon as we hit the turnaround point uh, we could see that we definitely weren't going up canyon anymore it wasn't a plan of turning going up Anderson it was just a matter of trying to get a hold of the packer and we need to get out of here. The fire was approximately half a mile away with a, a running crown fire. Shortly after arriving at the turnaround point, uh, the fire got in alignment with the canyon and the winds and the column pretty much blocked out the canyon and started racing down towards us. Uh, when we arrived here, we didn't have all of our uh, PPE on yet. We were uh, just hiking up the trail. We still had uh, t-shirts on, ball caps. Um, we had our line gear with us, our hand tools with us, but we, we weren't prepared to engage a fire really. So immediately when we got to this point, we dropped packs, everybody started gearing up, getting in full PPE. As soon as the fire turned and started to line up with the canyon coming down, we could see spot fires starting between us and the head of the fire. And they were, they were starting to torch rather quickly. Most of the crew was starting to head back. Lathan was turning them around. I wanted to wait for the packer when the 14-year-old the with his pack string ended up showing up. And uh, so we talked to him just briefly and told him to ride out the low water trail all the way back to the trailhead. 
and not to worry about the pack string, just go as fast as he could. And not long after that, uh, the, the senior packer was seen chasing his horses down the trail, all the pack animals down the trail. And uh, by that time, we already had spot fires within a couple hundred feet of us that were starting to get up and torch trees um, between us and the packer. And uh, the packer actually was kind of chasing the horses through some of the flames, little spot fires in the grass. And he met up with us and we uh, helped stop the pack animals and get them uh, cut free from one another. And so that way they could move a little faster through the trees. And it's kind of the incident that was referred to as the rodeo. The rodeo in this situation was pretty chaotic. It caused a lot of chaos. It kept people, it got people distracted from the main idea of getting down and moving down the trail. Um, the mules were all over. People were worried about that. Um, the, the wrangler was yelling at us to cut lines because the mules were tied together and they were getting wrapped around trees. We, we basically helped the wrangler get all those mules in front of us and he started moving back down the trail. And after they started moving down the trail, at this point the fire was on us. Spots, fires all around us, you could feel the heat. And we, we, were, almost, we were all together, spread out maybe within 20 yards of each other. We started moving down the trail a little bit more, came across a couple packs that had been dropped. As I'm running along, I'm kind of in the very back, all of a sudden I see a pack laying on the ground. And that's when it really starts to dawn on me that we're, we're trapped and we're gonna have to do something. Somebody else has already thought about it, that it's, it's time to find a deployment site. And so that's when it kind of started to realize to me, um, biggest realization was when uh, myself and the packer had the final words. Uh, I asked him to come deploy with us and he said he'd take his chances horseback and as soon as I said those words that's when I knew we had to had to find something right now. Um, at this point we crossed the river because the fire was on our right side and the only cool place at this time was on the opposite side of the river. Module leader, everybody crossed the river, started running down to the Anderson Creek Junction because we knew that was our last place that we saw a viable option. The fire was basically right on top of us. There was a little bit of discussion, should we run up Anderson Creek? Should we keep trying to run down the pack trail? And at this point, the decision was made to deploy our shelters. The module leader counted nine heads and he said, we're missing one, we're missing one. Anybody know where Monica is? And people looked around. The last time we saw her was right at the rodeo. We didn't see her crossing the river with us. We didn't, we didn't see her running to the Anderson Creek Junction with us. I remember a, a lot of people, including myself, not believing that it, that it could happen to us. Uh, how could we not outrun a fire, especially down canyon? Uh, fires are supposed to travel fast uphill, not downhill. And, and kind of those basic things you learn in fire school that uh, it didn't seem to be lining up with any of that. And we couldn't believe that we were actually caught. So it was a, a lot going through our minds then. At that deployment site, threw down the cross cut, took off my PG bag, and literally I said to myself, I can't believe this is happening. Never ever thought I'd be doing this, grabbing my shelter out of my pack. And I knew that you had to do it because at that point you couldn't go down river at this time, couldn't go up, up Anderson Creek. So you knew that you're relying on this little piece of equipment that you've been trained to use you're sitting there going, I have to use it. And pulling those tabs was probably the weirdest thing to do it for, you know, for real, real life scenario. And grabbing the, I mean, and luckily for nine years I've been a fire. Every time, every season you go through some type of training, but you never think you're ever going to have to do it. So to actually pull that, that shelter out for reals was a, a different experience. And when I pulled that shelter out, tried to flake it out, I remember almost laughing to myself because you hear over and over how the wind's going to be blowing, things are going to be loud, things are going to be crazy. You know, when you do it out on a lawn in a spring summer day, it's nice and easy to do. But in that situation, the wind was 50, 60 miles per hour. I mean, enough just to be popping trees over all around you. The heat, the embers, the smoke. I mean, it was, with all those different environment factors, it was a lot more difficult than any training I've ever prepared for. And to hang on to the shelter, that's absolutely true when you hear about wind being 
being super strong and you need to hang on to your shelter because when you flake that out and you shake it, if you're facing with the wind, if you're hanging on to it, it's going to be gone. And so the fact that those things in the training, even though I didn't actually get those real case scenarios in training, they're, they're in your head. So when you actually did do this, you were prepared for it. Well, I had a new generation shelter, uh, pulled out of the case really easy, out of my line gear. I dropped my line gear right as I crossed the river, so I came into the site with my shelter. Um, pulled the plastic tab, it popped out really easy, grabbed the two yellow tabs on it, flipped it open, the wind wasn't really extreme at the site, uh, pop, popped open really nice, it was uh, just textbook, just like the trainings always went, you know, how they talk about it. It was, uh, it wasn't something I thought about. It was just second nature to, to pop the shelter out and to follow the steps and, and put your feet towards where the fire's gonna be coming, uh, grouping people up uh, so we're in tighter proximity. Everything really seemed to, to go just like, like the trainings say. When the fire made the first push down, everybody else was in their shelters at this time prepared, but I hadn't completely gotten mine yet. I was using mine more as a shield because the fire initial push was probably 30, 40 yards on the other side of the creek from us. And so I used my shelter more as a shield from the embers and the wind and I actually took some pictures of the spot because it was, to me, it was a very, very unique situation and I thought if this is the only push that we're going to have, it'd be nice to have documented this, have pictures of exactly what happened and, um, and I wasn't threatened enough at this time where I had to be completely in my fire shelter. Well, uh, the first flame front that run us into the shelters really wasn't that intense. Um, I, I went into my shelter um, purely because I was assuming it was probably the main front. A um, couple of guys stayed out of their shelters uh, realizing what it was, but when they said that, uh, that it was done, at first I thought that meant that the main flame front had been by. Then could see the, the sea of green timber still around us, see spot fires throughout. Uh, we knew that we were going to have to go back in, or I knew I was going to have to go back in anyways. And so we got out of our shelters. The assistant module leader started getting everybody together by myself and the, the module leader um, took some fusees and lit up Anderson Creek, a little backfire, because we knew that there was already a spot fire up there. We knew it was going to be coming down to Anderson Creek, so we tried creating a little bit of space between us and when that spot fire hit us. The other seven individuals regrouped, got a little closer together, prepped up the site a little bit more. Um, there's a little bit of grass in there, not much, but we went ahead and cleaned, cleared anything out that could combust. Um, it was a really good deployment site as far as, um, the you know, it was flat, level, it was an old sandbar. Um, is really good, really good deployment site. The wind was still strong. You hear snags falling left and right. Couldn't see much. The smoke was very thick. I mean, just being out of your shelters for those five minutes that re, we reorganized and regrouped, your eyes were watering, your breathing already had changed, and you knew you almost had to get, you almost wanted to get back in the shelter just to get a break from the smoke. And at this time, the fire that had gone down Grable had crossed the creek and was starting to come up Anderson while the spot fire up above Anderson Creek were actually starting to come together. So we knew that we were going to have an intense, intense push through there. And so that's when everybody got in their fire shelters, grouped together, and rode this one out. When I got my shelter, when I knew I had to get my shelter, the situation was life-threatening. Life um, prepared best I could with the training, you know, had, def had my radio, had my water, um, you had to hold down the fire shelter because the wind was crazy. I mean, it, it, was, it was one of those things if when the fire shelter, the wind was blowing and the fire shelter would kind of collapse, the tent would fall down. You knew it, the, the heat from the fire shelter touching your Nomex was hot enough where you had to keep creating that air pocket. You'd actually have to hold down the shelter and punch that tent formation back up because you could hear the push going by, you could feel it. Um, you had to be breathing in the ground or through your Nomex, I mean, you couldn't be, just the air in the shelter was even getting hot to breathe. And it was a situation that I couldn't believe I was in. And also I thought, well, while I'm here, I want to document it. <laughs> and at this point, I, uh, I had a camera in my 
pocket that I've been taking pictures of, of this whole incident. I uh, stuck my hand out for a brief moment and just took a couple pictures of, of the fire behavior around us. I didn't know exactly what I was getting, but I knew that it was going to be something. And uh, there was one point where it was like, you know what, I think I'm going to make this, make out, make out of this situation okay, but if not, hopefully this camera will be okay and they'll have some pictures. I remember feeling like it was hard to breathe. I remember thinking that my back is on, on fire, like the skin, you know, stuff like that, because everything I'd heard of shelter deployments, people get burned still. And so I assumed that I was getting burned. Everywhere that felt really hot, I thought I was burning. Um, that wasn't the case. I didn't receive any burns, but that's, that's what it felt like. And I do remember fighting for not just air, but for something that was cool enough to feel like you could breathe it. I mean, it felt like you were sticking your head in the oven trying to breathe and, you know, kind of unbearable heat. I know I passed out for a period of time. I don't know how long. You know, it was definitely hot in there. It's, it was a struggle to get fresh air. So you're always, I had my hands right by my face, digging in the sand, trying to get cooler and cooler air to breathe. When that second push came over and it was so loud, you could hear people trying to talk, but you couldn't hear anything. The noise, it was freight train coming through. I mean, it was the loudest I've ever heard fire. Didn't know it sounded like that. You could hear the embers, pine cones, twigs, sticks hitting your shelter. I mean, it, I mean you hear how you could try to prepare for this stuff, but to actually be in it, it's, it's all there. You could hear trees snapping. Uh, you could hear the, the roar of the fire, uh, the wind, all of it combined. It's, it's just kind of like they say, it, it, kind of like a freight train sound when you're inside. Uh, it was, it's, it's definitely an intense sound. Um, I remember being a little spooked thinking about one of the trees that were directly across the creek from us coming back at us. I remember wondering if a rock was gonna break and fall off the top and roll down on us. Uh, just kind of some weird things like that that we were thinking of. Um, I thought a lot about family and friends while I was inside. Um, I, I also thought about the training, all the shelter deployments that I'd been through, the practice shelter deployments. Um, I thought about my boss taking me to a shelter deployment, exercise that focused on nothing but site selection instead of run and gun, pop your shelter as quick as you can. And that one come back to me and it, it, it felt like it was a good spot because of the rock wall, uh, because it would help protect us from a lot of the wind and a lot of the direct flame. We didn't have a lot of fuel loading directly in our site. I knew it was small in proximity as far as the crown spacing around us, but it, it felt good, so I, didn't, I wasn't thinking a whole lot about much else except family, friends. Um, I did think a lot about how I got in that situation when I was inside there. Uh, you can think a lot about in an hour, but. Once the fire pushed and it was just still way too smoky, a lot of heat, still radiant heat still around. You couldn't get out of your shelter, but it was quiet enough where you could try to start talking and asking, hey, are you okay? Yeah, is everybody all right? Yeah, you could kind of communicate a little bit, and that made you feel okay because you heard everybody else's voices, so you knew people were going to be okay. And so that was nice to have a little bit of communication with people. So we were in there about right at an hour. Um, pulled the shelter out, kind of walked around, looked at things. Everybody else was still in their shelter, kind of started, hey, guys, are you okay? Come on out. Let's, and so we, people started popping out, knowing it was okay to come out. And the scene when you came out, it, it was, it was kind of mind-boggling because our gear that was left by our shelters that had no fuel around them was melted. Tool handles, the plastic tool handles had burnt. I mean, so right there you're going, holy cow. That's how much heat was coming off of that 60-foot stand of timber 20 yards from us. And you looked at some of the shelters and see some you know, delamination and some burn marks, and you realize that if I didn't have that shelter right there at that time, you might not be here. So, And that was, that was kind of crazy because everybody comes out of that, and um, you look around at your crew members, and people have a different way they react to the situation. I mean, I came out and I was like, wow, you know, soaking it up, taking pictures and going, man, I made it through this. I go over to a buddy and ask him how he's doing. And it's a different, 
different level. I mean, he's not talking, you know, you could tell he's upset. And it's just like, hey, you know, he's like, all I could think about is my kids. Yeah. And so, so when you're there and I was happy to be in that situation, I kind of got brought down a little bit because you, you realize that people have different, different priorities in life. But we had each other there to talk to and comfort each other and talk about just what happened. And that was nice, but in everybody's mind, they were wondering, what, what, where was our other crew member? I mean, radio communication still hadn't been established. Uh, we tried, the module leader tried through almost throughout the whole, whole burnover to try to be getting hold of her. The whole mood over the situation was really somber because we thought we, thought we might have lost somebody. I mean, we didn't know if that person had rode out on the horses. And that's initially what we thought. We're just going, I hope she was able to make it. After we came out of the shelters, um, the communications were terrible in this whole drainage. Um, so it was really hard. I tried several times getting out on the radio uh, to contact ICP or to contact the dispatch center. And I couldn't get a hold of anyone. Then finally, a guy from the local unit that was somewhere out in the flats, he could kind of make out what I was saying. And so it was kind of long, back and forth. Yeah, you're still broken up, Travis. ICP, this is Schultz. He's asking how many people were with the Packer at the Jack Creek Trailhead. Just ask those people how many people were with the Packer. There were 10 people. Deployment at the Jack Creek Trailhead. They need to know how many people are there. No. Shelter We were trying to figure out uh, if anybody had made it out to the trailhead, mainly trying to find out what had happened to the two packers and also what had happened to Monica. Once the, the helicopter got overhead, Monica heard the helicopter, and so uh, we were able to get in contact with her then. And uh, we let the we told the helicopter there's no way they can pick us up out of here or anything. Uh, that we didn't need the services anymore. Everybody was accounted for. Uh, they let us know that uh, the two packers had made it to the trailhead. Everybody again had severe headaches and we decided to start our hike out knowing that we had to go through this particular stand of trees right here that was a lot of trees still falling, a lot of trees still burning. And so we spaced out and uh, tried to really keep our safety awareness up on the hike out. Then we uh, we crossed the river, back down to the trailhead. Ambulances were waiting. They checked uh, checked people out, and uh, you know, basically diagnosed everybody with smoke inhalation, and and there was a couple minor burns treated, is all. Um, and then at that point, it was oh, it was about ten o'clock at night at that time. <laughs> 